Hello, everybody. It's my great, great pleasure to welcome you on the URADOS uh, webinar, Out of Field Doses for Pediatric and Pregnant Patients in Radiotherapy. Uh, this webinar is organized by URADOS Working Group 9, but let me start um, to tell you some by telling you something about URADOS itself. It's a nonprofit organization which gathers about 600 uh, scientists all over Europe, as you can see on the map, and we are working with radio protection, radio perspective dosimetry, individual and environmental radiation monitoring, radiobiology, diagnostic and therapeutic applications, but also with radiation in uh, medicine, feel free to join us and uh, check uh, our web page. Working group, uh, Eurados is working, scientists in Eurados are working in inside the working groups and our working group, uh, working group nine, which is organizing this webinar, uh, is dosimetry in radiotherapy. And my name is Lidiana Stolartik and I have pleasure to be the uh, chair of this group. If you are interested in our, in our work, maybe after the seminar, uh, you feel free to contact us and the contact details you can find on our website. Um, the topic that we are working with are connected with uh, radiation dosimetry. We are working with small field dosimetry, bracket therapy, also with Monte Carlo methods, but we have a special focus on dosimetry for out of field patient dose, and that will be the topic of today's webinar. Uh, so, as we all know, the goal of radiotherapy is to deliver the high dose of radiation into the, uh, into the target. But at the same time, healthy tissues are also irradiated with radiation, with a lower dose or even very low dose, but which may have influence on uh, side effects. For example, on secondary cancer incidence, as you can see on the lower picture here. Um, according to the American Association of Medical Physicists, it is a physicist who is responsible for, um, for a determination of out-of-field doses. Oh, sorry. Yes, we are back. Uh, and uh, based on this determination, a physician is taking a clinical decision about a treatment technique. Uh, of course, it's not important for all patients, but in a special cases, it, has, um, it, ha it is meaningful. For example, for the cardiac toxicity, for the uh, implantable devices and electronic devices which patient has, for cataract and for skin dose, and for secondary cancer, especially for pediatric patients which has a long uh, life in front of them. And we will pay special attention to those type of patients and dosimetry for those patients uh, in our webinar. And also for the dose um, to the pregnant patient, which is undergoing radiotherapy. Those are rare cases, but very important. And that will be the topic of our last uh, presentation, which will be given by Marek. But before uh, we will start our webinar uh, and I will introduce our speaker. I would like to start by a short quiz so we will get to know uh, better and we will know who is on the audience today. We can start by the first question, Kirsten. So the question is about uh, profession. And we have a lot of medical physicists and we're happy about it and a lot of researchers. So I hope the webinar will be interesting for you. Next question, please. So the next question is about treating a pregnant patient with radiotherapy. So in general, we can see that it's, uh, it is possible. But maybe for a specific case. Next question, please. Um, so we would like to know if you have ever treated a pregnant patient with radiotherapy. So we have people with, with some experience in, in treatment of a pregnant patient. Mm. 
Next question, please. So we would like to know your opinion about uh, radio protection guidelines for pediatric uh, patients. So in general, we can see that those uh, guidelines would be needed, are needed. Um, Next question, please. Um, please share with us your experience if, uh, if you have ever measured out of field doses. And we can see that it's done as a research topic, but also for new accelerators or for special clinical cases. But sometimes it's also, uh, there are no measurements at all. Next question, please. So thank you for uh, our quiz. And it's my great pleasure to start a webinar and to welcome our speakers. Today, we will have three presentations by Jelka, Maria, and Marek from Working Group 9. And we will start by presentation by Maria Meyer from the Roger Boscovich Institute. Maria Flores, your. Okay, thank you, Liliana. So, hello to everyone. So my task for today is to give you an overview of the symmetry for secondary radiation in radiotherapy based on the research activities of working group nine. So uh, I will start with uh, definitions. Secondary radiation is a radiation produced by interaction between the primary beam and the matter. It cannot be avoided and because of that, non-target tissue is unavoidably irradiated. Doses deposited by the secondary radiation in the area outside the treatment field are called out-of-field doses. So why out-of-field dosimetry is so important? Out-of-field doses, as you have heard, may lead to an increased probability of unwanted effects of radiotherapy, including the generation of secondary cancers. To provide the best treatment of the patients, it's important to know the risk before the treatment and to estimate the risk, accurate dosimetric inputs are needed. TPS does not allow to accurately assess the out-of-field doses, so we have to measure them. Uh, also, uh, viable uh, data for out-of-field doses in literature is spread out and it's difficult to apply for a particular case. So new inputs are needed and priority is in the case of irradiation of children during pregnancy or for irradiations. Re so in order to perform the symmetry correctly, it is essentially to understand not only the properties of detectors, but also of the field being measured. So what do we know about secondary radiation field in photon uh, radiotherapy? The sources of secondary radiation are treatment nozzle uh, uh, and the patient's body. Uh, photons are dominant type of radiation and the main contributions are head leakage, collimator scatter and the patient scatter. And also if the energy of the primary beams uh, is high enough, production of neutrons will be possible primary in collimators. Although contribution of uh, neutrons is not high due to their large biological effectiveness, they have to be considered. So uh, what do you know about energy spectra of secondary radiation in photon radiotherapy? Here is an uh, example for photon and uh, neutron uh, energy spectrum. Uh, and uh, regarding photons, uh, we have to say that we have a, a a lot of low energy photons uh, and their uh, contribution is increasing with the distance from the beam axis 
And so uh, we uh, desire, uh, we request to have dosimeters with low uh, energy dependence because it's crucial, uh, low photons are crucial for that. Uh, regarding uh, uh, neutrons, it's uh, crucial to see uh, that we have a fast neutron peak ranging from 0 0.1 to 1 MeV in, and we have to cover that region since uh, these uh, high energy neutrons are crucial for those deposition. Uh, now switch to the proton uh, radiotherapy. Uh, secondary radiation and source of secondary ra radiation uh, uh, depends on the technique which is using to uh, for beam formation. In the case of passive scattering, there are a lot of beam forming elements and they are crucial source of secondary radiation. Nowadays, uh, uh, mostly in the world mostly uh, active scanning uh, is used and active scanning has greatly reduced amount of interacting material so the crucial source is patient for secondary radi radiation is patient body and in some cases we have uh, when we have to add uh, beam modulators then secondary radiation can uh, be produced between interaction of the primary photons and uh, elements of these modulators uh, in this case, also the, prime, uh, the dominant type of uh, uh, secondary particles are neutrons and uh, uh, photons, but in the uh, vicinity, proximity of the uh, field edge, we also have some, uh, we could have some uh, charged particles of protons. Uh, so just a, a brief look to the, uh, to the energy spectrum. First, for secondary photons, what, what is important for us that uh, uh, we have uh, uh, the, the fluence is ranging from 0 0.01 to 10. So we need dosimeters with a flat energy response in that, uh, uh, in that region. And regarding neutrons, uh, it's uh, important to notice that we have uh, uh, the high energy peak is uh, ranging uh, up to much higher energies. So uh, we have, let's say, additional high energy peak at uh, 10 to approximately 10 uh, MeV. Uh, and uh, the total neutron uh, fluence is the highest in the proximity of uh, proton radiation, and the ratio between low and high energy neutron fluences changes with the position. So it's... Uh, uh, we have to know where we uh, position our uh, uh, dosimeter. Uh, okay, so once more, uh, it's crucial to know that our detectors will be positioned in mixed radiation field. A uh, field mostly we will have photons and neutrons, and uh, uh, we have to uh, for photon doses we have to be aware of the presence of low energy photons and for the neutron detectors where uh, high energy neutrons are crucial for the dose deposition uh, we have to know which range we have to cover so how to measure out of field doses we need phantoms we need dosimeters uh, regarding phantoms we always start with a simple and reproducible water tank uh, it's ideal for characterization of symmetry systems, but it cannot uh, reproduce clinical treatments. So we need, for uh, real clinical treatments, we, uh, we need more complex uh, phantoms, such as, for example, anthropomorphic phantoms. Uh, regarding the symmetries, uh, there is no ideal one. So here you can see some important characteristics that has to be fulfilled. And so we try to choose the symmetries which will, uh, as much as possible, uh, 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 require uh, most of these characteristics. Uh, in our case, for photon doses, we uh, were using, we tested uh, and compared uh, passive solid state luminescent dosimeters, three types of them RPL, TLDs, and OSLs. And for uh, uh, neutron doses, uh, we used uh, passive neutron detectors for fast uh, uh, neutrons. Uh, uh, we use two types of them, nuclear track detectors and uh, bubble detectors. 
Regarding uh, Newton dosimetry, uh, I have to say that it's very challenging. We have to be aware of that. Uh, the point is that uh, uh, detected neutrons often have different energy that neutrons which contribute to the dose. And as you can see in this graph, so uh, low energy photons are usual, uh, neutrons are usually the positive si uh, thing signal, while uh, the dose uh, is uh, deposited by high energy peak. Uh, so uh, we uh, are taking uh, these detectors are taking neutron uh, fluence and we have to uh, to know the function how to uh, do uh, from this neutron fluence uh, get neutron dose equivalent uh, uh, neutron uh, neutron dose equivalent and also if we want to compare neutron and photon doses it's important to say that uh, uh, in the case of photon doses we will uh, all results will be expressed and reported as absorbed dose. So we will have milligrays for neutrons, we have millisieverts. Be aware of that. So here are the dosimetry systems used for uh, our comparison for photon doses or non uh, neutron doses, war new neutron, because we always can have some, uh, we are uh, measuring in the presence of other particles also. So we were using RPLs, TLDs, and OS cells. It's important to mention that regarding TLDs, uh, we uh, uh, were using three types of these detectors and depending on the uh, uh, ratio of uh, lithium-6 and lithium-7, they have a different sensitivity to thermal neutrons. So uh, these one with lithium-7 are have very low sensitivity, so they are good to measure photon doses for, uh, while other two types have uh, increased uh, uh, sensitivity to thermal neutrons. Uh, okay, uh, so for neutron doses, we were using nucle nuclear test detectors and bubble detectors. They all uh, cover uh, uh, neutron energy range, uh, uh, larger than uh, 0.1 MeV and uh, if we want to use it's important to use uh, to say that if we, when we want to use uh, uh, to detect thermal or high energies we have to apply uh, some types uh, particular converters uh, in our case uh, for not to detect neutron dose but to, to give uh, to have indicator of uh, thermal uh, neutron uh, neutron dose, we were using two types of TLDs with uh, uh, lithium seven and lithium six. Lithium seven is uh, sensitive to photons and neutrons, and so uh, using the difference of signals of these two uh, detectors, we can have uh, uh, information just information of, of about thermal neutron dose. Why thermal? Because uh, only this type of uh, 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 these detectors are sensitive only to thermal neutron, uh, neutrons. Okay, and here what we have: we started for uh, with a uh, water tank, and uh, we were measuring uh, photon doses. We placed uh, uh, TLDs, RPLs, or cells. And uh, uh, our results show that all dosimeters can be used for out of field dosimetry because we achieved good agreement between dosimeters uh, and also between dosimeters and the reference uh, dosimetry. Uh, only for OSL, we had a small overestimation for low energy range, but after uh, correction has been applied, uh, uh, agreement was good. Uh, also, we perform measurements in Bowman Phantom, and we achieved good agreement with, between these use dosimetry system. Uh, another thing uh, I also want to point out: so uh, uh, we, uh, in the treatment uh, in the tumor region, we had a really good agreement between uh, dosimeters and the treatment points uh, and the TPS. But, but in the out of field region, we notice underestimation of measured out of field doses by, by treatment planning system. Uh, and it was uh, shown also uh, in other uh, facilities uh, different, uh, where, where different algorithms were used. 
Okay, and uh, regarding uh, proton uh, radiotherapy, first uh, uh, I will show uh, the comparison of use dosimetry systems uh, with different uh, luminescent detectors. Uh, it's important to see that uh, we had a different response of uh, uh, used uh, dosimeters uh, depending uh, on their sensitivity to uh, particles other than, than photons. So if you remember, we have a neutrons and because of that, uh, as you can see in this graph, RPLs have definitely the less uh, sensitivity on neutrons and they are recommended to use for photon dose. Uh, these TLDs will have a higher response. Why? Because they are uh, reacting on the on the neutr neutrons as well. Uh, uh, also, uh, we uh, use the difference of two types of TLDs uh, to uh, to um, to get information about uh, thermal nu neutrons but it's not enough and adequate to detect fast neutrons which are dominating in radiotherapy. And also uh, I want to point out that uh, according to the results, if we, if we uh, compare uh, neutron and photon dose, neutron dose is, dominant, uh, it's, uh, dominating. Uh, also, we compared two types of used uh, PET detectors and the agreement was uh, excellent. And also uh, in anthropomorphic phantom, we compared uh, uh, used uh, nuclear trait detectors and also bubble detectors and agreement with measurements, uh, we did within measurement and uncertainties have uh, been uh, achieved. Uh, okay, and uh, finally, uh, if we put all together our results from uh, phantom uh, measurements for both and, uh, photon and proton uh, radiotherapy, uh, we can notice that photon doses are up to, let's say, two orders of magnitude lower for proton in comparison to photon radiotherapy. Also, uh, if we take a look just to the proton radiotherapy, neutron dose is dominating in uh, proton radiotherapy. As I mentioned, gamma component is less than 10% of total dose uh, equivalent. And so, what we have learned today, uh, so what is the message that you have to take? Out of field doses are of importance in radiotherapy of children, pregnant women, and for ray radiations. TPS are still not suitable for calculation out of field doses, and that's why we have to perform measurements. Secondary radiation in radiotherapy is mixed radiation field, so measurements are challenging, particularly for neutrons and combination of dosimetry system is needed. Selected dosimetry system that we used can be used for out of the uh, field dosimetry, but always we have to keep in mind characteristics uh, of the radiation field and properties of dosimeters, particularly, for example, energy uh, dependence and sensitivity to all uh, present particles. So, characterization uh, of dosimeters allows to continue research activity and move to the next step, and that's out of field organ doses for real clinical scenario. And about that, you will hear uh, in the next presentation with Andrei Zhevka. Thank you for your attention. Thank you, Maria, for a very nice presentation. And now I would like our next speaker, Zhevka Kniazevich from the Ruder Boskovich Institute in Croatia to continue with out-of-field doses for pediatric patients. And I forgot to mention that we have, uh, next to the chat, we have a Q&A section where you can ask your scientific questions and we will try to answer them at the end of this webinar. Jalka, please. Thank you, Liliana, for the introduction. So uh, <clears throat> now I will show you uh, some of the results, some selected results on the out-of-field doses uh, during uh, pediatric uh, during pediatric uh, uh, radiotherapy, uh, you heard in in, uh, in lecture from my colleague Maria why out of field doses are important, why measurements uh, are important and also uh, challenging. Uh, also, uh, <clears throat> uh, why we focus on pediatric patients. <clears throat> uh, 
<clears throat> because I, most of you know that pediatric patients are particularly sensitive, uh, have uh, increased organ radiosensitivity compared to adult patients. Uh, also, why we focused on brain tumor simulations? Because uh, brain tumors are the second most common tumor uh, in children. Uh, you heard also proton therapy. I think we are all aware that proton therapy has clear advantages in terms of short and long term complications. And this is <clears throat> very important uh, for, in, for treating um, cancer in pediatric patients. So these were, these, uh, these were all the motivations, the reasons why we focus on uh, pediatric, uh, pediatric patients. And after finishing these uh, measurement campaigns in laboratory clinic in water tank phantoms in, in, in BOMAP, uh, we moved to um, <clears throat> measurements of secondary radiation in photon radiotherapy. Uh, we focused on brain tumor simulations. Uh, we used two anthropomorphic uh, phantoms representing five and 10 year old child. And we measured um, out of field doses uh, for several uh, conventional radiotherapy technique, MRT, gamma knife. Also, we performed measurements uh, for craniospinal uh, irradiations also with two, uh, two different uh, techniques. Uh, the second part, the second um, uh, measurement, uh, measurement campaigns uh, were measurements of secondary radiation in proton radiotherapy. And in, in these experiments, uh, which were performed in, in proton beam scanning uh, facility in, in Krakow in Poland, um, we uh, measured out of field doses uh, in the same phantoms by using the same detectors and we use the same brain tumor simulations, craniospinal irradiations, and also in addition, uh, we tested and performed some experiments uh, to see the impact of uh, beam modifi modifiers on, uh, on out of field uh, doses. Uh, <clears throat> Now I will start uh, to show you some of the results on the out of field dose, uh, doses in pediatric craniospinal uh, irradiations for uh, two different photon techniques and also uh, one uh, uh, proton technique. Uh, craniospinal, uh, craniospinal irradiations uh, greatly increase survival rates for patients uh, which have uh, medulloblastoma. And uh, because craniospinal irradiations uh, are uh, require uh, irradiation of large target volume covering the entire brain and spinal cord, this is very important uh, and strong concern for the irradiation uh, uh, for children because large volume of healthy tissue uh, is, uh, is uh, exposed to unwanted uh, doses. So we made experiments into different photon radiotherapy techniques, 3D CRT and VMAT, and also proton radiotherapy techniques. And we used uh, the, the different, uh, the different uh, detectors, but I will not go into the de details about detectors because Maria already showed some of the results uh, about the dosimetry systems used. <clears throat> so if we compare, <clears throat> sorry, the comparison of the mean organ doses, photon doses with uh, uh, TPS. Uh, for VMAT uh, uh, measurements, uh, we observed that mean doses uh, to all organs of interest were under 50% of the uh, target dose. And also that uh, TPS uh, un uh, underestimated uh, the doses in um, almost all uh, the organs. Uh, if we... Uh, if we uh, look at the 3D CRT, uh, <clears throat> we can see that TPS in general overestimated the mean organ doses and that uh, uh, in comparison to VMAT, doses to thyroid, osophagus and gallbladder exceeds 50% uh, of the target dose. Uh, the highest uh, overestimations uh, was for the organs at the largest distance. Uh, because we have uh, their larger non-uniformity and also experience, uh, experiencing uh, larger dose gradients. Uh, for 3D CRT, those is uh, to uh, eye, uh, so the eyes are better, uh, better spared in comparison to, uh, to uh, VMAT. Uh, while for uh, thyroid, VMAT is, uh, uh, the doses uh, to thyroid in VMAT are lower in comparison to 3D uh, CRT. If we compare these two photon uh, techniques, uh, 
uh, with uh, uh, with proton uh, craniospinal irradiation, and uh, here on uh, this graph you can uh, see the comparison of photon doses. Uh, we uh, we can see that for all organs uh, we can observe much lower mean dose uh, compared to photon techniques, which is several times uh, uh, lower for lungs and breasts, and uh, <clears throat> up to three orders of magnitude for stomach and gall uh, bladder. Uh, if we compare total organ dose, so for uh, PBS, the total organ dose equivalent in su is sum of photon uh, component and also Newton contribution. Uh, for photon techniques, beam energies are below 10 MeV, so the contribution of secondary new Newtons can be neglect neglected. And we can observe that uh, 3D CRT is better spare, uh, showed better sparing for lungs, eyes, and breasts while VMAT is a better choice for most of other autofill organs, especially for thyroid. And this is important, thyroid uh, is important, uh, let's say, organ for uh, secondary ca cancer risk estimation. Uh, a, a more conformal treatment and up to two orders of magnitude lower autofill doses uh, are measured in this study uh, for proton uh, radiotherapy craniospinal irradiations and confirm advantages of the proton, uh, um, proton radiotherapy. Uh, sorry. Uh, the very important criteria on the selection of radiotherapy therapy technique which will be used in, in real clinical uh, uh, situation is those to uh, critical and radiosensitive organs such as eye, thyroid, lungs, breasts because due to second cancer risk and also risk of uh, other disease, diseases. This is very important if we are talking about the children, uh, especially young girls because they have strong sex and age dependence of the risk coefficients. So, uh, so um, according to our measured out-of-field uh, uh, doses, uh, both photon and newton doses, in this study uh, we can conclude that uh, proton uh, craniospinal irradiations are strongly uh, recommended radiation therapy technique for the craniospinal irradiations, for, uh, especially for, uh, for children. Uh, now we will move to out of field doses in proton scanning radiotherapy versus photon, but uh, for uh, brain tumor brain tumor uh, simulations. Uh, so we used again the same two phantoms representing five and ten year old child. Uh, we simulated brain tumor, uh, and we used uh, we measured uh, uh, out of field doses for three different uh, photon techniques. 3D CRT, MRT, and gamma knife, and also uh, we compared these results for proton therapy radiations. And really, it's important to uh, emphasize that we use the same phantom, the same detectors, and the same brain tumor uh, simulations. And <clears throat> for uh, cancer risk models, it's I think very important to provide dosimetric data uh, for uh, for under similar conditions using the same using the same time of uh, detectors, phantoms, and 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 so on. Uh, here you can see out of field doses of photon doses uh, for gamma knife and IMRT and for both phantom five year old phantom and ten year old phantom. And uh, <clears throat> the study showed that uh, for gamma knife radiosurgery, the eyes were better spread with gamma knife in comparison to MRT. But uh, we observed higher out of field uh, organ doses uh, um, for gamma knife uh, in comparison to highly conformal MRT technique for both, uh, for both uh, phantoms. If we compare measured doses for 3D CRT and IMRT as a function of distance, uh, the results show uh, uh, higher organ doses for five than for 10-year-old phantom and uh, average uh, three times higher doses uh, are um, measured for five-year-old phantom than for 10-year-old phantom for both uh, IMRT and uh, 3D CRT. 
what else was confirmed, and it was also mentioned in Maria's uh, presentation, the, the, uh, uh, the results were up, which were obtained in BOMAMP uh, Phantom, that comparison of measured doses and doses calculated by TPS showed that TPS underestimated out-of-field doses for both IMRT and 3D uh, CRT uh, technique. So this was uh, uh, photon uh, techniques. Uh, now some results on out of field dose measurements in proton techniques. And here it's comparison of uh, non-Newton organ doses for five and 10 year old phantom. Uh, why uh, I use here non-Newton organ dose? Uh, because uh, uh, in, in previous experiment we uh, observed uh, and we think that it's more correct to use non-Newton uh, dose uh, in order to express that the, the, the RPL dosimeters register not only uh, gammas, but also to one limited and small extent Newtons and some charged particles. So we think it's better to use non-Newton organ dose than gamma dose. So if we compare five and 10 year old phantom, uh, we can see that uh, secondary non-Newton organ doses are higher for five year old phantom in comparison to 10 year old phantom. Uh, but this is uh, the, the reason is that uh, uh, we have smaller distances from healthy organs to irradiated target in a smaller phantom. So the young adults and, and, and pediatric patients tend to receive an average higher secondary organ doses due to their uh, geometrical uh, factors. So these are results for the non-Newton dose. And here you can see Newton dose, uh, Newton dose uh, measurements for five and 10 year old phantom. And uh, compared to five year results, uh, uh, um, results show slightly higher Newton doses in 10 year old uh, phantom between 20 and 30 centimeters uh, from the from the isocenter and uh, what what is the reason why we have higher Newton doses uh, uh, the explanation is that we have um, pediatric models of Sears phantoms have a bone equivalent material so we we have uh, um, different higher uh, different uh, tissue density and uh, in 10 year old phantom we have higher uh, density that can and enhance the detector signal and also in smaller phantom what can happen with, uh, also uh, can happen that um, some newtons can ex ex escape from the phantom without the interactions and this could lead to a smaller dose uh, uh, while in the larger phantoms the probability of interactions is higher and the dose is higher. Uh, if we compare the whole picture, so the Newton, non-Newton and total doses, the, the situation is similar for 10 and five year old phantom. Here you can see the results uh, uh, for 10 year old phantom. And we can see that Newton doses are uh, lower than non-Newton doses close to the target. While uh, if we move uh, further away from the target, the secondary Newton doses become larger and larger and the non-Newton or gamma doses are uh, decreasing. Uh, <clears throat> you can see that here values for non-Newton doses are below uh, one milligram and not visible on, on, on the graph. Uh, now, if we compare the, the, whole, uh, the three uh, photon techniques which we uh, used, this is for 10 year old phantom. So gamma knife measurements, 3D CRT uh, out of field measurements and IMRT. And if we add the measurements, the total organ dose uh, for uh, uh, intensity modulated proton therapy, we see that proton therapy results in lower out of field doses compared to photon therapy. And it's one order of the magnitude close to the brain, so close to the target. And if we move further away from the target, it's more than two order, uh, orders of the magnitude uh, 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 difference. The similar situation is for five-year-old phantom. So the gamma knife showed the highest doses uh, following by 3D CRT, IMRT. And if we add um, uh, I, uh, intensity modulated proton therapy, uh, the, uh, uh, the results shows the lowest total doses. Also to, to emphasize that the to total organ dose for uh, proton measurements is a sum of uh, <clears throat> gamma component and also uh, Newton uh, component. This is just uh, uh, illustration. If we calculate uh, a total absorbed dose for different techniques, 
uh, for the full treatment. So we assumed, uh, and according to uh, literature and clinical experience, uh, uh, we assume what is the treatment dose for the uh, uh, brain tumor uh, uh, irradiations. And we can see uh, the total absorbed dose for gamma knife, for IMRT, and uh, uh, what is uh, obvious that for uh, IM PT, the doses here are shown only for thyroid and testis, the critical organs, and also the organs important for uh, risk estimation are uh, much, uh, much lower. Uh, our experiments, uh, which I showed you, uh, were performed without, uh, without uh, 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 range shifters. So we also wanted to uh, make investigation and tens and and uh, test uh, the impact of beam modifiers in proton beam scanning uh, treatment. Uh, so uh, it's also very important for the children uh, because the irradiation of the brain tumors, which are shallowly located, uh, so the irradiation of superficial lesions requires sometimes in clinical uh, situations the application of pre-absorbers uh, which supposed to reduce the proton range. Uh, so the aim was also to test out of field doses and the Im influence of conventionally applied uh, range shifter which is uh, attached to the nozzle and uh, to uh, make comparison with 3D printed beam compensator and to see how it influenced on secondary radiation. The colleague from Poland uh, made individually designed 3D printed pro, uh, proton beam compensators for the two phantoms, for the five-year-old phantom and 10-year-old phantom, and we measured, uh, we measured the out-of-field uh, doses. Uh, what are the main findings that uh, we observed? We observed higher photon out-of-field doses for the range shifter in comparison to beam compensators for both uh, phantoms. Uh, also for organs which are closest to the isocenter, like thyroid, Newton doses were lower for, uh, the, with the use of beam compensators than a range shifter due to Newton, med Newton's moderation in the target volume. And for more distant organs, lower doses for range shift than beam compensators. Also in parallel, we have results with, of active measurements and the results show that doses for most of the positions determined for uh, range shift radiations are higher than for the use of beam compensators. Uh, so the, the, the use of radiation shift, shift in compared to, to, uh, to PBS without the pre-absorber shows an increase of out of field, field doses up to a factor of two. So in, in uh, maybe clinical treatment, the use of personalized, uh, personalized 3D printed proton compensators can be safely uh, used and can be recommend, uh, recommended to use for uh, pediatric uh, patients. Uh, and at the end, some conclusions. So it's uh, from all the measurements, uh, uh, both in water tank and in anthropomorphic phantom, uh, proton uh, uh, beam scanning therapy reduce the out of field doses in children uh, uh, up to two orders of magnitude when compared to all photon radiotherapy uh, techniques. Uh, the differences between photon techniques and uh, uh, proton techniques is more pronounced for five-year-old phantom. <clears throat> also, Newton measured Newton doses are lower uh, than non-Newton doses close to the target. If we move away from, from the target, Newton doses become larger than non-Newton doses for the factor three uh, or four. Uh, also, beam modified modifiers used in proton beam scanning increase the out of field doses. So the use of, of uh, printed beam uh, collimate uh, compensators are highly recommended. And what was also uh, said in previous lectures, and it's, it's important to emphasize that uh, the main dosimetric challenges remains for neutrons in proton beam scanning, uh, requiring a combination of detector systems in order to measure out of field doses. 
and um, uh, just at the end, uh, uh, we performed a lot of measurement campaigns within uh, Working Group 9, and we gathered uh, a large database of a large database of the results, which we think it's very uh, important uh, and can be used um, for second cancer risk estimates and also to input uh, to analytical models for eventual clinical implementation and also as input to uh, epidemiological studies. Thank you for uh, listening. Thank you, Junka, for your presentation. It was very clear. And now I would like to invite our last speaker, Marek de Sanhuber. I'm sorry for my pronunciation, Marek. And uh, from SCK in Belgium, and she will talk about uh, doses uh, to a pregnant patient. Please, floor is yours. And please remember questions. Thank you. Yes. Okay, so I will be talking a bit about our activities within Eurodas related to radiotherapy during pregnancy. Now, in order to give you some background on the current clinical practice and the currently available data, uh, let me first tell you that one in 1,000 pregnancies are complicated uh, with cancer uh, during the pregnancy. Um, however, if we look closer to specifically the radiotherapy, this is only applied in less than 3% therapy is applied. This is mostly for breast, you can see in 55%. Um, now, important to say that chemotherapy can be applied, but not in the first trimester. So in the first trimester, radiotherapy could actually be a very important, um, let's say, alternative to chemotherapy. Now, but I said it already, 3% is, is not a lot if you compare it to the 70% of the cases. And... Um, we can say that generally radiotherapy is postponed till after delivery. Uh, why? It's actually treated as a sort of prohibited topic. Um, well, there is a, lot, a lack of reliable information um, uh, to the fetus during the pregnancy radiotherapy. Uh, says that the threshold for deterministic effect is 100 to 200 milligray, and generally people apply a sort of threshold that if you don't only think about deterministic effects, but also about stochastic effects, we need to apply the ALARA principles um, and ICRP has also reported on embryo doses of, of 10 milligray that, that may increase the cancer risk. Uh, up to 40% uh, over the normal in incidence. So, of, of course, there is uh, some debate and there is, of course, uh, a LARA principle supposed to be applied to avoid long-term effects. Um, Okay, uh, what are the general aspects? If we look at, you can imagine that the fetus dose will be dependent on the position where it is growing and it will always grow closer and closer. You can also see that in the picture. So, so the, the, la the later is the, the, the pregnancy, the higher will become also um, the dose. And it's generally assumed that uh, it's safe to do radiotherapy before the third trimester. In photon therapy, which is the main, uh, uh, the main used uh, form of radiotherapy now in 
days. They have built or they, ha they, they are using shielding to reduce the fetal dose. And you can see it here on the on, on the picture. On the left, you see a sort of castle built and already to um, be able to reach the fetus. On the right, you can see reporting on, on clinical um, those data. And this is uh, one example where they show that in breast carcinoma, the fetus dose can be between 40 and 180 milligrams. So in some cases, above the 100 milligrade threshold. For Hodgkin diseases, it, it can be up to 500 milligrade. So that's half a grade to the fetus. Uh, for the brain, it's, it's as expected also to be, be lower. Uh, um, what we also saw in this study is that for breast and Hodgkin's disease, the shielding was always applied, but it is not always the case for brain and head and neck um, in general, but long-term follow-up is limited, so this is something to consider. Uh, and let's say that the, the, the guidelines now for if you can, different clinical settings are nowadays still missing, and there is a a very important aspect to be uh, considered. If you look specifically to proton therapy during pregnancy, so we have seen already in the previous presentations that if we would use proton pencil beam scanning, it could reduce largely the outer field dose. So that is, of course, a very important aspect for the pregnancy radiotherapy. And this has been shown in many studies by our group. Um, and, but, and this is the, the proton therapy center in Heidelberg, from what we know before we can really move towards the clinical implementation. Show actually that there could be a tenfold or even um, more than a tenfold reduction in the fetal dose if we would use a proton therapy. However, as said, its implementation is still facing a dosimetric a challenge and a lack of, of uh, um, data and clear guidelines. So there is an important uh, um, aspect to be considered. What are the dosimetry challenges in pregnancy radiotherapy? Let me first say uh, the 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 use of anthropomorphic phantoms, to water phantoms, anthropomorphic phantoms of children, commercial patients. So we could have in using a random. Um, sometimes people are using random phantoms with some PMMA slabs and so on. I will show some examples. Uh, um, and we could also think of 3D printing technology. So this. Is, there is no commercial phantom available, so we have to be uh, creative and try to uh, build some. Currently, in clinics, people are using or some water bottles. You can see many of these examples here. Uh, how However, there is, of course, a need to, to the, of the pregnant patient and also various stages of pregnancy in the symmetry in pregnancy radiotherapy. Um, finally, if we, we're not only going to do measurements because that, of course, limits the applicability and the flexibility. Uh, we would like to do also calculation of fetal doses where we can really do many, 
many more calculations and we can do that uh, um, more individually for patients, for example. Um, and for the specific treatment plan and see how, how we can optimize treatment plan parameters and so on. So calculations of fetal dose are also very information from the whole patient. We usually own them. So computation of phantoms uh, exists. Um, we have the one from health. However, still future developments are needed to allow for patient-specific dosimetry to not variability um, in sizes and shapes and so on. So that's still an open um, field. And then finally, during the measurement, during the radiotherapy, uh, you have some examples here. Sometimes people are using detectors on the belly of the patient that could help in predicting the, let's say, fetal dose uh, measurements as long as you do a, a, um, a pre um, um, irradiation was as a predictor of the of the of the dose of fetus during the pregnancy uh, are needed. Uh, so let me end. Uh, this is a, um, our working group. So of course during radiotherapy. So of course this is an important um, aspect in radiotherapy during pregnancy. We have the working group six, which is most the computational dose part and as mentioned already computation of symmetry is important uh, also in this aspect and, and working group 12 is doing uh, more dosimetry during imaging and why that, that is important is because patients are also so uh, image during their treatment and this aspect needs to be considered. So we actually work in, in a sort of loop. We validated with phantom measurements, um, as can be seen on the uh, down right corner, the dosimetry from the imaging systems. So it's an intercollaborative work. And we have started uh, with the building and setting up a Monte Carlo simulation framework. Just uh, show you some of these uh, highlights of this, these results. So we have used computational phantoms of different, uh, of a few, well, close by, but different stages of pregnancy uh, and as a first approximate I mean as a first example we irradiated the, these patients with a, a proton brain radiotherapy um, what we noticed is that uh, there was large differences between the phantoms uh, so we could see that the highest fetus dose was measured in the catch fetus uh, which was um, and we, uh, there was a, a much lower dose. We verified the impact of tissue composition, but we finally concluded that mostly the geometrical differences caused such uh, discrepancies. It has a tilted head, which also caused the, the, the target dose to be a bit more uh, elevated, let's say, the target region. Um, and also the fetus position is, is different. And so all of these have led to quite big differences in fetal dose. So we realized that there are important challenges towards um, really modeling the geometry in detail and even for patients different, um, in different irradiation conditions. So we had a spherical tumor located in the brain with the two different cultural rotations. So the beam was either coming from the top of the head or from the side. Um, and we we compared actually the use uh, of a range shifter as, as well. And the doses that are reported here are are for a 
30 fractions of two grays, and you can see that the fetal dose range between, let's say, 13 macro sievert uh, and 182 macro sievert uh, to the feet. So this again is very low um, compared to the threshold, but you can see that there is an impact. You have a modulating component. The angle is important, so um, you clearly see you, you can clearly see that it will increase also the dose to the. Uh, given the time, I cannot go too much in detail, um, but you can read it also uh, in our future papers. And um, finally, the the development of a pregnant fan has been uh, moved forward a bit by, by uh, the group in um, in Oshchek, uh, the Faculty of Medicine, um, and they've developed a, a Tena phantom. It's a it's a physical phantom which which has, uh, um, you can see it on the right, which has, is subdivided in five cent molds are printed and then uh, they are don't only exist in a, in a physical phantom, but also in a vocal to use it. They have been validated in photon breast radiotherapy. We do measurements also with this phantom in proton PBS therapy in, in also other groups that are investigating um, 3D printed uh, technologies to build more more um, sophisticated phantoms and more anthropomorphic and more de detailed to the different stages of pregnancy and so on. So that's uh, uh, BFS and also we in SEK, we are uh, planning to do this in the future. So. As concluding remarks, uh, um, yeah, what we know is that, okay, radiotherapy during uh, pregnancy is not done routinely now, up to more than a factor of 10. So this is something in this application. Uh, however, the clinical implementation still we feel as well as the need to, to expand there on um, working towards more guidelines and so on. For that, we need to develop phantoms uh, and to also develop the symmetry protocols that would allow, allow people to do uh, an accurate dosimetry of fetal dose. Thank you, um, Marie, for your presentation. It was really nice and interesting. And I'm very course, sorry to, the, to some of the participants with uh, problems with the, the sound, but um, I hope that there will be a recording if you and are finally, uh, still uh, as many, interested. And the computational uh, so uh, to conclude our uh, uh, webinar, we have a poll that we would like to ask you a few questions after the, to the webinar. To allow even individualized uh, those imagery approaches for patients. Um, so the first question is uh, about um, your consideration <laughs> to out-of-field doses in the treatment planning. Do you consider it, it at all or would, or would you like to consider them in future if such an option would be available or do you think it's not uh, important for the during the planning of the treatment? So I see answers are coming. Maybe two seconds more for the last participants. So uh, what we can see is that uh, uh, people who are using treatment planning system would like to have such a, uh, such a possibility. So I hope it's a future for uh, further development in uh, 
out of field doses and to intercorporate the model into treatment planning uh, system. Um, can we get the next question, please? And last, uh, we would like to uh, to know if you find the topic of the webinar interesting, and if you would like to, uh, if it's if it's helpful, if it will be helpful in your uh, daily work. I'm happy to see that there is no answer with no because we were a bit afraid about it. So <laughs> it's good to good to know that uh, that there is a, uh, that this the um, community find it um, find it interesting. Okay, so I think that's it. Um, so thank you for the participation in the uh, webinar. We had a uh, few questions uh, which are answered in the Q&A um, session, but maybe we can um, still answer a few of them. Um, Jelka, there was a question about the um, um, modeling of the risk uh, and risk assessment. Uh, how? how or what needs to be done on the measurements provided to proceed to the risk assessment from SARA? Mm -hmm. So uh, there are, uh, uh, let's say, existing cancer risk uh, models. And uh, now next step would be to use this, this data as, as input to these uh, cancer risk models and to, to try to model and predict uh, risk. This could be, uh, let's say, one of our next steps because so far, uh, in in some papers we tried. I think Maria tried some risk uh, modeling, but we didn't, uh, let's say, seriously still uh, consider this data as input to to uh, existing cancer risk models. But this could be future. This should be a few one of the future tasks. Yeah, I think we can also comment that uh, risk modeling for uh, pregnant patients or uh, fetus is especially uh, difficult because the uh, the epidemiological model that we have are not really created for this group of patients or for this uh, for this group in general because they are not based on the same um, uh, um, data set. So that's. That's difficult and that this work has to be done not only from the dosimetry point of view that we should measure the doses, but also from the epidemiological point of view that this, those data are simply uh, missing. Yeah, a measure is needed to perform these patients uh, specifically for proton therapy. I'm secondary cancer is taking a long time before it develops, so it will be um, still a long shot before we can really say we can estimate and the risk. Maybe the next question for, from Patricia: for uh, What is about the simulations of out of field doses like for radiation therapy on computational phantoms? Are no. there any experience about this? And but yes, there are available measurements models we can use. I think Marek showed but a bit of it for the fetus. Capability. That's a bit of a challenging area, I would say. In, uh, mostly for proton therapy we did it uh, and the agreement was quite nice um, 
So we can do it. However, if you really want to do a clinical plan, which is quite complicated to model, um, we, yeah, we we have not done that. That's the extensively. So we use quite a, a, a simple uh, beam geometry that we could model in MC. TMP easily. Uh, if I um, may add, in, in, in literature, but, going through literature, yeah, there are, uh, nowadays more, with DOPA, let's say data on Monte, from Monte Carlo many, simulations than on, on uh, uh, measurements, that, that but it's not easy also to uh, compare of, uh, our results. A lot of we, options um, for the future. Got, that we can be working group nine with, also with the plan uh, literature to, data on Monte Carlo simulations because. Uh, sometimes different setups, different phantoms are used, uh, and it's 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 really not uh, easy to compare. Uh, let's say this Monte Carlo simulation data found in the literature with uh, uh, what we measured. And maybe the last question is to from Harold to Maria. Um, Nice talk <laughs> and question. Could you again say how large neutron out of field doses are in comparison with uh, photon out of field doses? And I guess that was for proton radiotherapy. You are muted, Maria. Sorry, sorry, sorry. Uh, yeah, I uh, answered him and I, I think it's for proton. So, yes, sure. yeah. So it's uh, if, if you could repeat for uh, others to aha uh -huh, for sorry for presented water tank measurements and uh, uh, regarding uh, proton technique uh, we noticed that gamma doses are less than ten percentage of the total dose and total dose uh, combines uh, proton and neutron dose. And one uh, important conclusion that we uh, that we have from our comparison between protons and uh, photon radiotherapy technique is that uh, proton PBS uh, is really offering lower at out of field doses, at least for the cases that we that we tested. So so even if the neutrons are produced by protons, the total out of field dose received by the patient is still. Um, lower than for uh, conventional uh, pro uh, photon radiotherapy. I think we are a bit out of time right now. Uh, thank you very much for your participation and thank you again for all the speakers. Uh, I hope we will see you on the annual meeting uh, of Eurados in Porto and feel free to contact us and to work together with Working Group 9. Thank you very much. Thank you. Bye-bye.